Elizabeth Jane Coran, later known as Nellie Bly, was born on May 5, 1864 in Coran Mills, Pennsylvania, to Mary Jane and wealthy Judge Michael Coran. She was given the name Pink early in life because her mother always dressed her in pink dresses. Shortly after her sixth birthday, Elizabeth's father died without warning and the family was thrown into financial distress. Her mother remarried a short time later, but Nellie Bly's stepfather was abusive, so Mary Jane filed for divorce. Many have come to believe that this is the reason that the girl had become such an advocate for women's rights. Nellie attended Indiana Normal School for one semester, but due to lack of money had to drop out because her family couldn't afford to pay her tuition. But Nellie had found a love for writing there and wanted to pursue a career in journalism, which was almost unheard of at the time. Begging her mother in 1880, the two moved to Pittsburgh and owned a boarding house. There, a opinionated column called What Girls Are Good For and the Pittsburgh Dispatch anchored the young women and wrote a blistering obituary about the editor and signed it Lonely Orphan Girl. The editor was so impressed with her passion and resilience that he almost immediately hired Nellie to work for the paper. At that point in history, though, women were discouraged from having careers in which they considered men jobs. So Elizabeth took the pen name Nellie Bly after Stephen Foster's famous song. Nellie Bly wrote hard-pressing stories on the poor and oppressed. Drawing from her mother's experience, she also wrote on the inherited disadvantages women had in divorce proceedings, and numerous articles on the lives of poor women who worked in Pittsburgh bottle factories. Nellie's articles fascinated readers but drew criticism from the business community. When companies threatened to pull advertisement from the dispatch because of her articles, Nellie was assigned to a gardening story. When she turned in the article, she included her resignation that said, I'm off to New York, look out for me, Bly, and moved to New York thinking that she could easily get a job with a newspaper there. She wanted to work for publisher Joseph Pulitzer's New York World but couldn't get an interview. After four months she still hadn't found a job and had run out of money. Her situation was desperate. So one day she persuaded her way past the guards at the World and into the office of the managing editor Colonial Cockrell. He was so impressed with her that he gave her 25 retainer which was a lot of money at the time before she left his office to hold her until she could be hired on Blackwell's Island. She rented a room in a tenement and started acting absolutely insane. The police were eventually called and a judge sent her off to the asylum. Nellie kept a journal that exposed the appalling conditions at the asylum and the brutality and the maltreatment of the patients by the staff. She also noted that many of the people held there weren't even crazy. There were even women whose husbands had them committed just to get rid of them and women whose only reasons they didn't speak English. Nellie endured these filthy conditions, rotten, stale food, and physical abuse from the doctors and nurses for 10 days before her boss rescued her. Nellie's articles behind the assailant bars and inside the madhouse caused an upheaval in New York, and after further investigations were launched, the New York officials finally provided more money and a change in care for the people at the asylum. Nellie wrote, I always made a point of telling the doctors I was sane and asking to be released, but the more I endeavored to assure them of my sanity, the more they doubted it. The insane asylum on Blackwell's Island is a human rat trap. It is easy to get in, but once there it is impossible to get out. Nellie's most famous story began in 1889. She proposed to travel around the world faster than Jules Verne's character Phineas Fogg and around the world in 80 days. Editors of the world were wary of the idea. Women didn't travel without an escort, plus they carried a lot of baggage. Yet Nellie insisted that she could beat whomever they sent and threatened switching over to another newspaper to continue the story. She got the assignment on November 14, 1889, and she boarded the Hamburg American Company Lanier Augusta Victoria, carrying only two small satchels and a check coat, which would soon become her trademark as she traveled the 24,899-mile trip. We'll be right back after this commercial.
Nellie even got to meet Jules Verne himself, who eagerly encouraged her to break his own fictional records, and that she did. On January 25, 1890, Bly returned to New Jersey 72 days, 6 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds after she had left Hoboken, beating Phileas Fogg's time by more than a week. Nellie's stories had improved circulation of the paper so much that Bly believed that she had earned a bonus, but yet she received nothing extra. Her reaction was so tender, her resignation. But in 1893, Bly staged a return to the world. She continued to focus mainly on women's rights and combating discrimination. She exposed corruption, causing the country to call for social reforms. Bly became a spokeswoman for all women. In 1894, Nellie Bly married a millionaire named Robert Seaman. So she retired from her precious journalism for a time. And even though she was unemployed, Nellie was never lacking any opportunity. Her face covered trading cards, board games, and many other goods. As her marriage continued, Nellie became more and more involved with her husband's company, the Ironclad Manufacturing Company. She even painted it a milk can of her own design. And when Robert died in 1904, Nellie then by going Elizabeth Curran Seaman took over the company and became the world's leading female industrialist. Uh, she took over management of his firm, and she brought about many massive important changes to the company, building a recreation center, establishing hunting and fishing clubs, setting up an employee library, and removing employee piecework. But soon she went bankrupt because of embezzlement. Bly traveled to England in 1914 to visit an Australian friend and found herself in the outbreak of World War I. Nellie contacted her former world editor, Arthur Brisbane, who at the time was working at the Harris newspaper, the New York Evening Journal, and made arrangements for Nellie to become a journalist once again. Nellie Bly became the first American war correspondent, and she wrote articles on her experience at the war's front lines. What had started as a vacation turned into a five-year tour of duty. She stayed in Europe until 1919 when she returned to the States to tend to her mother's failing health where she continued working for the New York by writing regularly to the Evening Journal. She had been given her own column and dispense advice as well as her own opinion on important subjects while helping poor women find jobs while raising money to aid widows, children, and others who faced hard times. She held that job until she died of pneumonia on January 27, 1922 in her 50s. Nellie Bly worked hard making a difference in the way the world saw women by making a stand and becoming one of the world's best in a man's job. Her fantastic work and stories made an inspiration to women everywhere, and she became famous throughout the community and world. She pioneered the field of investigation journalism by helping out her community. Elizabeth Jane Coran, later known as Billy... <laughs> Elizabeth Jane Coran, later known as Nellie Bly, was born on May 5th, 1861. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the librarian's giving us dirty books. <coughs> <laughs> it's, it's about to start.